The summer's hottest concert series is back. Jazz at the Shed takes place every Wednesday night, now through September 14th at Shed Aquarium. Enjoy a night of live music from premier jazz musicians, breathtaking skyline views from Shed's lakeside terraces, food, drinks, 32,000 aquatic animals, and complete fireworks show. Tickets are on sale now at shedaquarium.org slash jazzin. Become a member today and receive free admission. Jazzin at the Shed is sponsored by Chase. Blog Talk Radio. Hi folks, it's Chris Bailey here, and it's always my privilege and pleasure to be engaged um, with Jamaicans who are doing really interesting, creative things around the world. And do we have a creative person with us today? We have Paula Williams Madison. She's a chairperson and CEO of Madison Media Management LLC, C, and it's a Los Angeles limited liability company that invests primarily in emerging media, entertainment, and communication businesses. She is a native of Harlem, and she lives with her husband, Roosevelt, in Los Angeles. Paula has been involved in this breathtaking documentary, Finding Samuel Lowe from Harlem to China, about her Chinese heritage. Her emotional journey spans from the U.S. to Toronto, to Jamaica, to China. Finally, reunited them Three hundred of their, their grandchildren's Chinese relatives that they never imagined existed. My partner in crime will be doing an interview will be Janice Maxwell, and she'll be engaging Paula in this very interesting dialogue. Janice, take it away. Oh, thanks, Chris. Hi, Paula. How are you Hi, doing? Hi, Janice. I'm good, Janice. How are you? I'm doing all right. Well, as we know, the first day of um, Chinese New Year for 2015 will begin on February 19, 2015, and um, this is the year of the goat, um, and it means that you are honest, intimate, and can be easily moved by the misfortune of others. Um, as we all know, there were Chinese immigrants that started to migrate to Jai, um, to Jamaica in the 19th century, primarily from the Hakka tribe. And um, there was also another wave in the 80s. But, Paul, you have a very interesting um, heritage. Help us to understand your Jamaican roots. Well, my Jamaican roots are directly from my parents. Both of my parents were born in Jamaica. They lived in Jamaica until probably around the age of 30 when they immigrated to the United States. My mother was born in Kingston. My father was born in Kingston. Both of them, uh, the previous generation before, on both for both of them, one parent actually um, hailed from Moko. You know mm-hmm. Moko, which is in um, mm-hmm. Clarendon Parish. And uh, one of the things that I was hoping to unravel, still don't have quite a handle on it yet, was if their families even knew each other in Moko before the children met in Kingston many years later. But that's my Jamaican heritage. Um, my mother, my mother is a was a uh, product of a Chinese man and an African Jamaican woman, and my mm. father is a product of two African Jamaicans. I see, I see. So, mm, what triggered your love and development of your fine, fine skills to take on this documentary? Well, I guess from a number of um, angles, I would have been um, stimulated to do this. One, my mother was a three-year-old when her parents split permanently, and... um, the circumstances are such that my grandmother um, vowed to never let my grandfather see his daughter again. So my mother never saw her father from the time she was three years old. Mm-hmm. Um, so we grew up with a mother who looked very, very, very Chinese in mm-hmm. Harlem. And mm-hmm. we look like we are 
black Jamaicans. Mm, so yeah. growing up that way with them as as children of a single parent in Harlem, it made for a lot of questions from people towards us, but it also had us growing up with a mother who longed to be connected to her Chinese family, but she didn't know how she would ever find them. So that was one stimulus. The other the other one was somewhere um, around the age of 12, I became fascinated by history. So I ultimately, through high, through high school and college, spent a lot of time reading and studying and I guess ultimately became a historian. I majored in history in college and then I'd say thirdly, I became a journalist. And all of the the skills and the training that I developed as a journalist I think prepared me to start the investigative search, the records and archival um, examinations that would have allowed me to finally find some information about my grandfather which then allowed me to find the family after about a, a 100 year separation. So you basically you honed your journalism skills to trigger to help you to learn about who you are, your ancestors anyway. Were there any mentors or industry leaders to influence your your style of investigative journalism? Um no, not really. I I I uh came from the school of believing that Investigative journalism was almost a redundant phrase. Um, mm. I believe that as a journalist, you are bound to investigate. And so I was very much attracted to that style of journalism when I was a young newspaper reporter, and then ultimately I transitioned to uh, having a career as a uh, journalist in television. I managed, uh, ran newsrooms. So I think that... Um, I learned many decades later, like I learned probably three years ago, that I was taking steps throughout my entire life that were, those steps were preparing me for undertaking the search to find my family uh, because so many things fell into place. Once like the stars aligned. Looking. You would say the stars aligned, huh? Right. Um. Yeah. What are some of the emotions did you experience when you learned about the Asian side of your family? I remember when I was watching the film, I believe you were in China, and then you had to basically sit down to, I guess, recoup. Do you remember that, when you were on the stairs? Yeah, well, that that was when I, for the first time in my life, was was physically in proximity to the rate to the remains of my grandfather. That was at the cemetery where my grandfather was buried in Guangzhou, China. Guangzhou um, is the is the name that years ago used to be called Canton. So I was actually, I guess in a way of stating it, I would have been kind of in my grandfather's presence. Not really, but I mean his remains were there. And it, what I was hit by at that moment was really that the journey... Um, the culmination, being in the vicinity of my grandfather's remains with another 19 black Chinese, my brothers and our families and the family of um, another child of my grandfather's who my mother had never known she had she had any of these siblings. But um, he had another son after my mother was born his name was Gilbert by a different Jamaican woman and I'd found during the course of trying to locate my family in China I was connected with Gilbert's children who lived in Jamaica and in Brooklyn New York and uh Florida Texas they were they had moved to the United States years before the irony was that when we lived in New York as adults probably 10 miles away my first cousins were living there, and we didn't even know that each other existed because our parents didn't know that they were siblings. But they went along with us to China yeah. on that trip. And it, and that was the overwhelming part of it. The emotions were quite overwhelming. Yeah, I've had something similar like that happen to me where, uh, unless I was in Jamaica, and they're like, Maxwell, 
And then we we started putting the pieces together. It's like, no way. We're that close and so close and so far. So that yeah. was pretty interesting. Yeah. You know, the Jamaica's motto is out of many one people. When did this um, um, motto be, begin to resonate with you? Well, I mean, I grew up in New York, and so I grew up as the child of Jamaicans. What's interesting is that I I I have found that the children of Jamaicans who live in the United States, although we were not born on that island, uh, the culture of Jamaica is so strong and the overlay is so strong that if you ask us, as even as children, what are you, you say I'm Jamaican. So mm-hmm. I have known from the time Jamaica had its independence in 1962. I mean, uh, you know, I had the flag and my father took me shortly thereafter to the Commonwealth Games, which were held in, on the island. And, uh, you know, the the people, the understanding, the history, uh, I've, I've known about Jamaica and that I was Jamaican from the first memories that I have. I'd met M- Mr. Bustamante um, as a child in Harlem. Um, really? So I was, mm-hmm, I was raised very much as a Jamaican um, in the diaspora. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah. So this, this is the year of the code. How are you going to celebrate Chinese New Year this year? Uh, that's an interesting <laughs> question. Uh, you know, I never celebrated Chinese New Year as such until I found my family in China. And uh, in 2014, me and about, oh, I'd say 20 of my cousins from all over the world, we converged on China and actually celebrated Chinese New Year there, which was oh. an amazing experience. This year for Chinese New Year, I will be here. I'll be here in the United States. I just came back from spending two weeks in China where I, we spent Christmas and um, the calendar New Year uh, mm-hmm. and had a New Year's party at my first cousin's house in uh, Guangzhou. This year I'm going to be just coming back from the Chinese New Year, the Hakka Chinese New Year celebration in Miami where uh, the documentary Finding Samuel O will be shown. And I'm going to take that time to just sit and get some rest because I have been roaming all over the world, really, um, showing this film. I'm, I will be screening it in Hong Kong on February 8th at the first ever Black History Month celebration in Hong Kong, and really? on the way back from Hong Kong, mm-hmm. and on the way back from Hong Kong, I will spend a couple of days in Honolulu at the Honolulu Black Film Festival where it's being shown, and then I'll get back here for one night to Los Angeles before I leave for Miami to show it at the Hakka Chinese New Year Festival. And so I, the point of all this is that for a lot of us, and probably for a lot of your listeners there wouldn't necessarily be a a realization that in Hong Kong there is a celebration of Black History Month, but there are multinationals there who are largely from the United States and Mm -hmm. from England who um, have had sporadic celebrations, but they are formalizing it now, and this is the inaugural month-long celebration. In Honolulu, I don't know that people would have known that, wow, they're having a Honolulu Black Film Festival? Yeah, and, and and there are I've been to film festivals in Canada and the uh, United States and Trinidad and Tobago. So I've kind of been roaming the planet for about the past year. Um, yeah, but but the original when you look at the old old pictures of the Hawaiians, the original Hawaiians, I forgot what they're called. They they were they looked more black than they say the a modern or an image of a a modern Hawaiian. And it's interesting, um, so in Hong Kong, in China, they're going to make Black History Month in February. And the reason why I ask you that is because um, they have Black History Month in in London, but they celebrate Black History Month in October, and that's their official month. So I'm just curious, in in China, Black History Month will be official in, in, in February? Well, yes, but I want to make sure that we're clarifying. Remember that Hong Kong just was um, uh, repatriated with China in the past 
oh, 10 years or so when the mm-hmm. British, right, when that agreement came about. So while it is considered China, it's not mainland China, and you still have to have passports and customs and so forth to go between Hong Kong and China. So it is Hong Kong that's celebrating Black History Month, not China. Okay, so, and it's going to be... From now on, it'll it'll be February. Will be Black yes. History Month. Mm-hmm. Oh, because it's it's actually it's actually hosted and started by Black Americans. So oh, okay. of course they're celebrating it. Um, yeah, All right. In a parallel way to the United States. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, as you know, tonight is Miss Universe, right? And we're having um. So one of the people who is represented is Casey Fatta. And I don't know if you know the issue about Casey. She's extremely light. And um, for a long, long time, dark-skinned Jamaican women were basically not even an issue. You, you just weren't going to be a Miss Jamaica if you were dark. And then, But they changed that. They, t- um, they At least they made an effort to. But the, the trend going back now is to choose the... Um, the biracial or the very light-skinned Jamaicans. They have, as you, they have two Miss Jamaica. They have a Miss Jamaica World and Miss Jamaica Universe. Well, tonight is Miss Jamaica, I mean, Miss Miss Universe, and she's very fair. But the current Miss Jamaica World is um, a black Chinese. She's, she's biracial. And the only reason why I'm bringing this issue up is that, say, in the United States, if you have one drop of black blood, it makes you black. Right, but prior to while well, in Jamaica until the late 1970s when they were trying to change that, we're going to include a rainbow of women to be considered beautiful. Biracial Jamaicans, particularly Chinese Jamaicans, they were um, a, it would be a, a um, say a pig, pigmentocracy type of thing or shadism. And it's not just a Jamaican thing. If you go throughout the Caribbean, you see the same the same color dynamics. I mean, it's going away, and we're happy about that. But um, but since we're talking about Jamaican culture in particular, they would have something called say if you went to school, it would be a Chinese royal because you're biracial, and and that was ascribed to color and class. What experience did you have when you were doing your research? Did you encounter people talking about color and shade and being biracial Chinese? Did that give some sort of, um, I guess, uh, um, elevate your social class in a pigmentography or a shadism context? Did you learn no. about that? Uh, well, mm-hmm. I would say that um, So, so the historic, description of that that I've learned throughout the years is, is it's called a color caste system. Mm-hmm. Which I think you're referring to a shadism. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I would tell you that my mother's experience growing up as a biracial uh, black Jamaican and Chinese child, she was actually discriminated against in her black Jamaican family because, uh, as my mother said, the name she was most often called by her grandmother who raised her was you half chinese wretch so i would i i think that depending upon where you sit and depending upon your perspective you might see it one way and then of course it could be another way i think the thing to be careful about is that um in my experience many jamaicans are taught that they are jamaican they don't necessarily break it down by, I'm an Indian Jamaican, I'm a Chinese Jamaican, I'm an African Jamaican, but some do. But I think that if, that particularly in the diaspora, when people um, leave the island, the first description that they use is that they are Jamaican. And yes. when they and when they um, convene in another country. They convene as Jamaicans. Now, what my experience, again, is that there can be gatherings, and they'll frequently be built around school uh, allegiances, the alumni associations. Some schools, mm-hmm. St. George's, some schools, Alpha schools, they were mixed schools, and in some schools there were more Chinese that went to those schools as opposed to you know, Indians, for example. But what I'm getting at here is I think that um, the perspective varies, 
I am a brown-skinned person. I don't fall into the realm of light-skinned by any stretch of the imagination. My mm-hmm. mother looked more Chinese than anything. And my brothers, mm-hmm. my two older brothers and I come in three shades, dark, medium, and light. My father was mm-hmm. very black-skinned. And so, and so what I'd say in my experience is that I'm certainly not going to sit here and say that shadism doesn't exist because it does. It exists among uh, black Americans, too. It exists among, certainly, um, Anglos, um, and by Anglos I mean from England. It exists among Italians. The, the, there is a, a, I think, mankind will figure out some way of creating a hierarchy Mm-hmm. And 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 it's frequently on skin color. The only thing that I would say about this trend that you mentioned uh, about picking beauty queens, as though, you know, and I, and you got to forgive me. One, I didn't know that that was happening tonight because I tend to not. I don't really care. Um, yeah, yeah. But but I don't know that it's necessarily a trend. And if it and if and if we are going to identify beauty, of course, we as people of African descent of the African diaspora, we want to see our beauty reflected too. And we've been shut out for so long that that's why we would want to see more African um, beauty queens. But then I think we just got to be careful to remember that that doesn't mean that we then exclude those who are fairer skinned and who would be mixed with other races because, you know, uh, as you said earlier, Jamaica's motto is out of many. We just need to not get into trends where we're excluding others. Right, because they, had, they, had, they were doing that for a long time, then they stopped because a lot of people are complaining, and then apparently no... There was even a situation, I remember this, this was in the late, in the 70s when they picked a really more African-looking woman, and the pageant actually dropped her. They, they When she won, all her sponsorship left, and then they... Um, the reason why her sponsorship left, they said she is not marketable for the international stage, and we're not going to invest this kind of money on this woman. And she had to end up suing the beauty contest. Yeah. Do you remember? A, um, do you remember what well, I don't Michael, remember the what name. Michael? Well, do you remember what Michael Manley's wife looked like? Yes. Yeah. So Michael yes. Manley, of course, was the was the offspring of one of the. I would call it almost royal families of Jamaica, and he right. could have, if he had chosen to, he could have passed for, you know, a, yeah. a, a white man, and he married a woman, Beverly, who was probably a little darker than me, who had an afro like I do, and it set Jamaica on fire. It set them, right. they went, I, I sat back and giggled at the cultural and sociological mm-hmm. upheaval going on because, oh, my God, he he's not supposed to marry a woman who looks like that. And I sat back and applauded and said, it's going to break this nonsense down. So and, and it is. that, and and, that and, also and, happened in the 70s. And we're happy that these things are, are going away. I just brought that up because the current Miss Jamaica, well, the, um, the Miss Jamaica world is, is a Jamaican Chinese, um, black Jamaican Chinese. But... Um, after doing this, your documentary, how can folks use the knowledge of this past to better their future? Well, in my particular case, for me, uh, this was a circumstance where I, my my mother was never going to be a whole person having such a large portion of her um, makeup closed to her. So, so... I was raised, and my brothers were raised in Harlem with not much family around us, and we grew up being told how important family is, but we didn't have much family around. What, mm-hmm. for me, this search has done, it has made um, whatever that hole was, that for my mother was a gaping hole, and for me was one that I stared into and said, well, where are they and why... Why can't we find them, and why don't I know who they are, and how come I've never seen my grandfather? I didn't even know his Chinese name back then. Mm. And these are things where just in terms of the human passion for knowledge about oneself, um, is it, it, it's natural. 
And having found that out, what I have now done has been able to position myself um, in 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 history from the Jamaican side, the African Jamaican side. My family is descended from the Akan or the Ashanti of Ghana. I know that for certain, but I can't go back and say ten generations ago who was in my family and what the name was and where that person lived and all the above. On the Chinese side of my family, my family has a documented, recorded lineage going back 3,000 years. So I can find the 10th generation. I'm the 151st generation of the Lo clan. And so what it does is it positions oneself in the world, but even with that, even with that, what it has meant for me and what I say out loud to people is that the African man was the first man. So even mm-hmm. if I can share a documented history being Chinese, my history as an African goes even farther back. I just can't document it through no fault of my own. Of it is because course. such documents were destroyed. So how can folks get to see your fine work if they're not? Well, I, uh, they... that's, yeah, we have a, a website called FindingSamuelLow.com, and on it we list and post all of the upcoming screenings around the world and and where they are. My family happens to own a television network called the Africa Channel. And Mm -hmm. what I'm hoping to do is, um, since the Africa Channel only has a $10 million, I'm I'm sorry, 10 million subscribers um, throughout the United States and the Caribbean, uh, what I'm hoping to do is recoup some of the cost of the production by selling it to a more widely distributed network first and then showing it on the Africa Channel, say, in a second run. So other than that, we're showing it in festivals right now, and I am hoping I have a uh, an, an agent who's trying to sell it for more um, for wider distribution on a more popular network, say the, the Oprah Winfrey Network or Discovery or A&E or something like that. So do you have any parting wisdom? I'm sorry, do I have any... Parting wisdom for our, oh, parting for our, wisdom. our audience. Yeah, I I say that um, particularly for those of us of the African diaspora, we have lost in a lot of instances information about ourselves. And for the folks who are Jamaican who might be mixed with Chinese, I would recommend that first you go to a Facebook page called Chinese Jamaicans because mm-hmm. on that Facebook page there's an entry there that lists the 40 most common Chinese names in Jamaica. Most mm-hmm. of the Hakka who went to Jamaica to pick to cut sugarcane after the slaves were freed by the British, most mm-hmm. of them come from Guangdong province. So if you're okay. seeking the information on how to find your family, one it would be to go to Chinese Jamaicans once you know your family's Chinese name. And I'd recommend that you go to Ancestry.com because there are a lot of records that are aggregated there. And there's a free website called FamilySearch.org, which has an amazing amount of information, birth certificates, military records, tax rolls, etc., that can be very, very helpful in helping you find and connect with your family. So to learn more about Chris Daly, visit CuttingEdgeApp.com. To learn more about Jamaican Diaspora, visit JamaicanDiaspora.com. To learn more about Paula Madison's movie, visit FindingSamuelLow.com. Paula, we really enjoyed spending some time with you. Bye now. Thank you. don't go to geico.com car insurance can be confusing like swedish techno confusing bark bark meow meow dance with me purple cow bark bark meow meow Ooh, you lovely cow geico makes it easy with 24 7 access all you have to do is go to geico.com and you could save money on car insurance it just makes sense unlike you know dance with me purple cow i like your mood the summer's hottest concert series is back. Jazz at the Shed takes place every Wednesday night, now through September 14th, at Shed Aquarium. Enjoy a night of live music from premier jazz musicians, breathtaking skyline views from Shed's lakeside terraces, 
food, drinks, 32,000 aquatic animals, and complete fireworks show. Tickets are on sale now at shedaquarium.org slash jazzin. Become a member today and receive free admission. Jazzin at the Shed is sponsored by Chase. 